Well, let's return to our top story now. Lucy Ledby will be sentenced today for the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of six others. But the former nurse has indicated that she does not attend, intend to attend the sentencing, which has been described as an insult to her victims' families. Well, the Children's Minister, Claire Coutinho, joins me now in the studio. Uh, good to see you today. Thank you for coming in. Good morning. Um, the front of, uh, of The Telegraph today says that Lucy Lepi could be forced to face her victims' families in court using existing legislation. Is that right? So, at the moment, there is a law in place which can uh, get perpetrators to make sure they go to the court. That is really important because it means that they can hear, for example, the victim's impact statement, uh, which is their moment to, to talk to the perpetrator about what they've done to them and their families. Uh, and if you don't do that, you can have someone's custody extended by two years. Uh, I do think it sounds like more law is probably required. The Justice Secretary has said he's very committed to making sure uh, those laws are in place because I think we can all say that these crimes have been some of the most sickening that I've seen in my entire lifetime and it's really important that victims are able to have that moment in court with the perpetrator there and the perpetrator has to face that moment of justice. But, it, but if existing legislation is there, why is it not being used to bring her to court? Why do we need more laws? Surely we just need the existing legislation to be enforced properly. Well, I'm sure they will look at everything that they can do to make sure that that is enforced. Uh, but I think there are some changes that it sounds like are needed as well to make sure that in every instance the perpetrator has to go to court and have that moment, as I said, of justice. What changes are needed? I, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm confused. If, if essentially it says the judge has the power to bring people to court, why is that not being followed? Well, look, I'm not a justice minister, but I think you know, one of the things that may be a challenge is if someone gets a life order, then extending custody by two years might not be enough of an incentive for, to, to make sure that people come. Um, but I think you know, these are things that the Justice Secretary will set out. And what I do know is that he has committed to making sure that that law is in place and he's very uh, concerned that we do that. Robert Buckland has suggested over the weekend that, that she should have... Uh, it broadcast into her cell, the victim's statements, uh, the victim impact statements and, and the judge's sentencing. Do you think that's a good compromise? Well, look, I, I haven't seen the details of exactly what he's suggesting, but I do think it's really important that, you know, she understands exactly what she's taken away from those families. I mean, these, as I said, are some of the most horrific crimes that I hope any of us will see in our lifetime, and I think it's really important that she faces what she's done. I mean, in, in terms of facing those families, Having somebody who's committed crimes in court in front of you as a, as, as, as a victim's family, it's important for them too, isn't it, to see her receive justice. That They are, are, are losing something, aren't they, by her not being in court? I think it's very, very difficult for them. I mean, I feel very sickened on their behalf that they don't get that moment because for so many people going through something so awful, so traumatic, that's the one bit where they get to have their say to the perpetrator. So I think it's really important we do everything we can to make sure that happens. Uh, in terms of, of the inquiry into the circumstances behind Lucy Letby murders, it's, it's not going to be a statutory inquiry at, at the moment, which means it then therefore doesn't have the power to compel evidence or, or people to produce documents. It, so it effectively relies on goodwill uh, for those involved to share their testimony. Sh should it become a, a statutory inquiry? Well, whenever something like this happens, there's always a debate about whether it should be statutory or non-statutory. And there are different benefits to both. As you say, with a statutory inquiry, it means you can compel people to give evidence. With a non-statutory inquiry, it's often much quicker. Uh, I think in this case, everyone wants to make sure that this will never, ever happen again. And I think speed is of the essence to make sure that expectant parents across the country can feel assured that they know that there's steps in place to make sure that this won't happen again. Um, but the work that's being done now, I think, really is the most important part, and that's working with parents on the terms of reference which will come out in due course to make sure that they're happy with everything as well. And you think it's important that, that parents actually do have a, a part to say in, in the role that this inquiry should have? Yeah, exactly. I think it's really important that we work with parents to make sure that they're getting what they need from it as well. There has also been a suggestion from a leading barrister that the inquiry should appoint a foreign medical expert to, to avoid it being influenced by pro-NHS bias, because essentially they're saying, you know, it'll be the NHS marking its own homework otherwise. Do you think that's a sensible idea? somebody external? Well, this is one of the things that the discussions at the moment that are taking place will, will look at and make sure that um, that's in the terms of reference. But I think the really important thing here is that we get to the answers that we need to make sure that this can't happen again. Indeed. Um, 
You're making an announcement today about child minders, trying to encourage more people to become child minders. The number of child minders in the UK has halved over the last 10 years. This is a massive failing of the government, isn't it? Well, look, it's not unique to this country. It's something that's happened in different countries. But I do want to see more childminders. Um, in my time in this job, I've gone to shadow several childminders. I've spoken to, to lots of people doing this job. And I'm in awe of the work that they do. It's absolutely incredible. They get brilliant educational development outcomes for children, and they give this extra flexibility to parents as well. So one of the things that we are looking at is why so many are, are uh, coming out of the system and the barriers to entry as well. And one of the things that has come up is properties, which is why we've taken this step today to make sure that we're writing to everyone in the property sector. So whether they're a social landlord, a housing association or a developer, to make sure that we take out some of those barriers. Because one of the things that we've heard is one in eight childminders who want to do that job aren't able to do so because of the property restrictions that they face. I mean, the, the, the sector itself doesn't think that that is the main barrier to entry and says that this announcement won't make a big difference. I mean, when we look at the... If, you, if you're thinking of if you'd like to become a childminder, there's so much you have to do. You have to do an introduction to childcare course, an early years foundation stage course, then be on an early age register, a paediatric first aid course and a DBS check. Now, I suppose most, most people would say, well, that sounds pretty sensible. You've, you've got to do some qualifications to show you know what you're doing. You've got to be DBS checked. You've got to know what happens if a child collapses. But then they also have to do a health declaration from their own GP, public liability insurance. They obviously have responsibility for their own income tax and national insurance, which is quite a lot of, of, of administration and paperwork. They have to pay a fee to the Information Commissioner for data protection regulations. There are huge regulations on the ratios of children to adults. I mean, these are the things that are putting people off childminding, not whether or not their landlord says yes or no. Well, so I think there's a few things. One of the things is the time it takes to registration. And as I set out in the because letter, of that's... Because this admin that the government's created over the last 10 years. So as I set out in the letter, that's one of the things that I want to look at. I want to make sure that people can get their registration in 10 weeks. And we make sure that it's a sensible amount of time. Uh, and as you say, the burdens of them are appropriate as well. Um, a second thing is often loneliness is something that childminders talk about. So we're changing the ways that childminders can operate together. And a third thing is sometimes finances as well. So we have raised the hourly rate. We're investing, uh, making the single largest ever investment in childcare. We're doubling the amount that we spend over the next few years on childcare, raising those hourly entitlements. And I'm going to be writing to councils to ensure that childminders are paid monthly because I've heard from people that I've met that sometimes they're paid every three months, which can be difficult to manage, particularly at times like these. So we're taking additional steps to this, but, but one of the things I think is really important is one in eight childminders who wants to do this amazing job are currently being stopped from doing so because of property. So we want to take actions in that area as but well. But it's the seven and eight that you should be targeting, isn't it, not the one and eight? So the seven and eight are able to operate in their property. It's the one and eight who are being blocked. OK. Uh, final question about the Women's World, World Cup. Um, Obviously, everybody's pretty sad that they didn't didn't make it, but an amazing achievement that they got as far as they did. Do you think Rishi Sunak should have, should have gone to the World Cup final? The fact that, that our Prime Minister and our future King, neither of them went, does it perhaps suggest they're just paying lip service to the women's game? No, I don't think so. So the Foreign Secretary was there and the DCMS Secretary was also there. So this government was represented. And I know that the Prime Minister would have loved to have been there, but he's also got a huge amount of work to do and I think the travel time is probably difficult. Um, but I know how proud he is of the Lionesses. We all are. It's an amazing achievement to get to a World Cup mm. final. It's absolutely extraordinary. Do you think he would have got on a plane if it was the men? To be honest, I don't think he would have because his really? work schedule is so busy and I know that from, from working with him. Um, but I do know how proud he is of the Lionesses, like we all are. It's such a tremendous achievement. It was absolutely just brilliant to see. OK, Claire Coutinho, Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing. Thank you very much.